Chapter 29 Meanwhile, Antonio had bent down and picked up a small, rusty pin. Antonio, give me that pin, Francesco demanded. We don't need you to scratch yourself now. Francesco stood beside them, and, as he leaned against a pillar, he began to scratch a little picture onto its plaster surface. Why do you get to use the pin and I don't? Antonio complained. Because I'm older and more careful, Francesco explained. What are you drawing? Antonio demanded, jumping up to get a closer look. The most beautiful goat in Italy, Francesco said softly as he continued to draw. But you've given her wings, observed Antonio. Goats don't have wings. It's what I wish for her to have, Francesco whispered. With wings, she could fly to America. Come, Dominic, Antonio called. Come see Francesco's funny drawing. Come see Violetta with wings. Dominic looked at the drawing and smiled. It's good, he said, but she's not eating anything. Francesco smiled, too, and was about to draw something for her to eat, when suddenly the line lurched forward and they found themselves moving through the big doors. Antonio covered his ears with his hands, for the din of the noise in the great hall was deafening. A great swell of sound echoed off the walls and bounced around them as the people were talking, laughing, crying, and yelling, all in different languages and all at once. Dominic's eyes searched the empty walls as they began to climb up the grand staircase. Gone were the photographs, gone were the displays. There were no tourists with cameras, no gift shops, no computer screens. There were just people, lots and lots of people. It was as though all of the photos and displays from the museum had suddenly come to life. Dominic and the others stared wide-eyed at the strange assortment of faces and clothing. When they had finally reached the first desk and the inspector had looked over their papers, he tried talking to them in English. Dominic was stunned to realize that, hard as he tried, he couldn't remember a single word of the language. It was as though he had never known it. Non parlo inglese. I don't speak English, Francesco told the inspector. Parla italiano. Do you speak Italian? Francesco asked the man. But the man shook his head no and called for an interpreter to help them. He, then he pointed to the names on the tickets and spoke it again in English, in words the boys could not understand. The interpreter, who knew English and Italian, translated for them. Cantori brothers, go to the next line, he said. Cantori? Dominic whispered. Why did he say Cantori? How does he know my name? Michiano Candiano, Francesco tried to explain to the man. My name is Candiano. We are the Candiano brothers. The man took their tickets and showed them where the shipping agent had written their names. Antonio Cantori, Salvatore Cantori, and Francesco Cantori. The man read aloud, Cantori. What happened to Candiano, Francesca asked. The interpreter shrugged. The shipping agent wrote it as Cantori. That's your name now. Dominic stared as chill shot up his spine. But that is not our name, Francesca cried. Maybe not in Italy, the interpreter explained. But here, in America, it is. Things are not like they were back in Italy. You have crossed the ocean. You're Americans now. Francesco thought this over. Cantori, he whispered, rolling the name over on his tongue. Sono americano. I am an American. I am a Cantori. That's my name, Cr Dominic cried. Yes, now it can be your name too, Francesco agreed. No, you don't understand. His voice trailed off into a whisper as he caught sight of the glint of gold peeking out from under Francesco's shirt. It was Salvatore's key, the key that would one day be his own. S.C., Dominic whispered the initials he knew so well under his breath, and suddenly he began to understand. If Francesco's name was now Cantori, and if he kept the key to give to his son, and that son gave it to his son, and it eventually came to Dominic, then could that mean that Francesco was Dominic's great-grandfather?'